Hi there, and uh, welcome to the Jeff Lerner Show or to my YouTube channel if that's where we're seeing this. I'm really excited today uh, that I have a, a special guest who's also be become a, a friend and a, a colleague that I've gotten to know over the last, I guess it's been a couple months now, um, and who's going to be talking about something that is one of the hottest uh, concepts in the market, both in the market of real estate, in the market of, of you know, home-based business, in the market of of startups and entrepreneurship and just a, a really a disruptive concept that I think epitomizes, you know, an economic shift as a whole, uh, which is Airbnb and the concept of, of uh, hosting. And it's not just Airbnb, but it's, you know, hosting or the, the sharing economy as it comes to real estate. Anyway, his name is Brian Page. You might have heard of him. Uh, you probably will recognize him. He's like the I would. I don't want to embarrass him, and Brian, maybe you'll disagree with this, but I would say you've become almost like the poster child for this this concept of of how to how to get involved in real estate without having to own the real estate and still leverage it and monetize it through uh, through these platforms. The creator of BNB Formula, which, as far as I know, is the best selling product on this concept, um, and uh, honestly, fellow award uh, click for uh, what's it? What, what's that award we won called? Eight figure award. Eight figure award. Fellow eight figure award winner from ClickFunnels, and just honestly, all around awesome guy who I'm really excited to welcome to the show. Brian, welcome, man. Thank you, thank you, Jeff. I appreciate that. I'm glad to be uh, talking with you here. Was that was that a long enough introduction? That was great. You know, I was thinking poster child. I was like, I'm definitely too old to be a poster child. Maybe maybe one year in my past, but uh, not any longer. <laughs> Well, no, you are, you know, I think you signify this. You're honestly, you're the guy that, I mean, I've been intrigued by Airbnb for a while, but you're the guy that sort of crystallized it for me. Like, hey, not only is there opportunity here, but there's so much opportunity here that somebody can create a course around it and sell millions of dollars that course and have mm -hmm. the backstory and the, 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 have it back out in the, in the form of testimonials and success and results and like, like really impacting thousands of people's lives. Mm -hmm. I've Which had people ask cool. me that. I've had people ask me that. They're like, why, why would you sell a course if it works so well, if this thing works so well? And I'm like, and I'm like honestly, I didn't set out to sell a course. I had so many people that were asking me, just friends of mine, friends and associates and just people that I knew were like, how are you doing what you're doing? Like, I've never heard of this. And it wasn't really in the consciousness of the public. And so that kind of is how I led into teaching. Didn't know that was going to blow up into a big, a big business in and of itself. Yeah, you know, it's the number one... A uh, question that I get, I, I, whether it's, I, you know, I, I get messages through variety of channels. A lot of it is Instagram DMs, fair amount of Facebook messages, uh, direct outreach through YouTube on my page, my Facebook page. I mean, it's like, you know, five mm -hmm. or six different channels. Um, it's like the same question though. It, it, it's what do I do if I don't have a lot of money? Mm -hmm. And frankly, until I found your strategy, my, my stock answer was always affiliate marketing. Because it's, you know, you don't have to create the shopping cart. You don't have to support the product. You don't have to create the product. You don't have to merchant the product. You don't have to do all this stuff. You just mm -hmm. essentially sell other people's stuff. Well, actually, to me, Airbnb or your concept, it's like the affiliate marketing of real estate. Because it's yeah. other people's marketing. It's, it's, a, it's, an, it's a, a third-party marketing platform like Airbnb or VRBO. You're able to Someone leverage. else's property. Yeah. Someone else's property. Someone else's Someone else handles the transaction. Someone else facilitates at least the customer support. You can outsource most of the fulfillment. Mm -hmm. um, it's, yep. the, it's the affiliate marketing of real estate. And I think that's what has attracted me to it. But, but why don't you back us up a little bit? You mentioned that you were doing it. You were getting these results. But uh, just because I know you have a really cool story and, and you know that the goal of my channel and my show is, is that I really want to connect and I hate us and them language because to me it's, we're all just us. But when I use it, what I, what I say, mean when I say that is connect us. And by us, I mean people who have kind of gotten over the hump that most people online are trying to get over. Mm -hmm. The hump of like, man, if I can just make this amount of money or achieve this level of results, then I can, I can be free from the grind that most people have to deal with. So that's yeah. what I mean. Us who have achieved that to try to pull us back down to our, bare element where it, it reduces this differentiation that I think the internet and the industry tries to put on us mm -hmm. that like we're the guru or we're the knowledge source or we're the oracle or whatever. It's like, no, we're like, we're just the dudes mm -hmm. or the, the women. We're the men and the women that just did a thing daily long enough to get a result. 
Yeah. And so I want to pull you back to before you were Brian Page, the king of Airbnb. <laughs> I just All want right. I just want to meet Brian. I want to meet okay. Brian and his pain and his struggle who needed something to work and this happened to be it. But tell me about that guy and, and kind of how you got from there to here. Sure. Well, you know, I've been a real estate guy my whole life. Right out of college, I was looking for a way to create cash flow. I had read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Robert Kiyosaki. I was a big fan. I loved the idea of getting out of the rat race. And like a lot of people, I was looking for that elusive, um, you know, passive income, you know, and, and, and uh, I was looking for a way to, to be able to go do the things I wanted to do and not have to work a job that I hated. And I, I didn't like any of the jobs I'd ever had my whole life. I'd been fired from many jobs. I couldn't hold down a job. I told my dad I was never going to work a job. I didn't know what my career was going to be. But I did want to make money <laughs> and I wanted to make money so I could go enjoy my life and that kind of thing. And so I was looking at real estate right out of college. That was like the number one like vehicle for at least I saw creating wealth. And so I jumped into real estate and started flipping homes. And that was early 2000s. I started flipping homes. This was before there was any TV show. There was no flip this house, none of that stuff. It was mm -hmm. all still fairly unknown. And people, in fact, people used to tell me, well, you can't flip houses. That's illegal. I was like, what's illegal about buying and selling property? I don't, I don't get it. So everybody thought it was illegal and it was crazy, but I, I did really well flipping houses and I had a great mentor. And, and um, uh, after just two or three years of that, I, I ended up becoming a millionaire in my tw 20s and um, thought I was a big shot, thought I had figured out life and everything was going to be roses from there on out and not knowing that the real estate cr uh, crash was right around the corner. So that was about 08 when the real estate crash happened. And that was where my life changed dramatically because it, uh, I went from being just a broke guy that had some success to being worse than broke. And I was, uh, I was in debt to the IRS to the tune of seven figures wow. okay. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, and bankrupt. Wow. And yeah, I was, I was basically, I didn't declare bankruptcy, but I was ba basically bankrupt and lost all my properties. And you know, a lot of people went through this, this, this big crash, but for me, it was the worst time of my life. And that out of that birth, this idea, I had to come up with a new idea because I still believed in cash flow. I still, to this day, think everybody should be trying to earn cash flow rather than income, uh, earned income. And, and I, I just wanted to find what was, what's the next thing I can do to create, you know, consistent cash flow in my life. And I found that Airbnb was that. And that kind of set me on this journey to where I'm at now. Well, first of all, I want to, I want to recognize you. Um, I don't usually interview people that had more debt than me. <laughs> I, uh, I, I don't have, tell a lot of people this, but I, yeah, I was, I, I got a letter from the IRS. I, w I wish I still had that letter. I got to find that letter. It basically said you owe us $1.3 million. Oh yeah. You got to find and that. I was oh, like, I, holy I crap. Had, yeah. uh, now, thankfully had, that's all been settled and I'm, out, I'm past all that, but it, it, you know, it makes you not want to get out of bed in the morning when you realize uh, uncle Sam's after you. And that was because of all the, all the phantom gains that I supposedly had with all the properties that I had lost to foreclosure and, it was just a mess. Wow. And it would make you, I mean, for years, that's, I didn't want to do anything. I didn't want to get, I didn't want to do anything, any kind of business. I was just trying to do the minimal amount possible to pay my bills every month. <laughs> just fly, fly below the radar, right? Trading, trading, trading water, not certainly not dreaming of, of becoming successful again. You know, I, uh, I was 490 something thousand dollars in debt in that same year, 2008, when my, wow. my house of cards collapsed, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And I have, I have the letter that was one of the default notes that said about 250, it was 253,000 of the total in one letter. And I have used that letter like a hundred times. You in saved your letter. I wish I had saved my letter. Money. I don't actually have the letter anymore. Oh, you but don't? I, have, okay. I have some old screenshots of it that I use and it, it pays huge dividends. So yeah, find the letter if you can. Um, <laughs> but I'm, I'm impressed. Your letter can definitely beat up my letter. It, that's a big letter. One, 1.3 million. Um, but yeah, I can totally relate. You know, when I started online after that, my name's Jeff Lerner. I, I actually added an A to the spelling of my last name, made it L-E-A-R-N-E-R. -E -R. Wow, okay. Because I, I just thought anonymity is good for me right now. Yeah. You know, and uh, I don't know if it made any I difference I know or the not. feeling, I know the feeling. <laughs> but it, isn't, that, isn't that horrible to be in a place in your life where Either you're scared to succeed, you're scared to be seen succeeding, you're scared to even try. Well, the funny thing was that when I started in real estate, I had a mentor and I started buying properties like crazy. The very first month in real estate, I started buying all these properties and flipping them and everything. And, and, and it was because I went to my mentor and I said, this, sound, this is kind of risky. I'm signing my name to all these mortgages and 
what happens if it doesn't work out? And, and I remember he told me, he said, well, what's the worst that could happen? Like, really, what's the worst that could ever happen? I said, well, I guess I could lose my properties. I could, I could ruin my credit and then I could be broke. And he's like, kind of like you are right now, broke. And I was like, yeah. He's like, well, is that, if, is that worth risking that to go get what you want? And I said, I guess. And so it changed my mindset. Little did I know that it, the worst would, would happen for me. But then I had to start over again and ask myself that question again. What's the worst that could happen now starting over? And I think everybody should ask themselves that question. What is the worst that could happen? I mean, if you're risking your, your life to do something, you might want to consider not doing that thing. But in business, there's very few times where we actually risk our lives. There's no such thing as a debtor's prison, thankfully. So, you know, you can do big, bold things knowing that you may fail miserably, but that's kind of the journey of many. All the entrepreneurs I admire have gone that same journey. So I was willing to do, I remember after getting back in and starting again in, in the new business, I told myself, if I got to go bankrupt five times or 10 times, I don't care how many times it takes, I'm going to do it until I'm successful. And that, that was kind of my mentality and still is. So, so, so why is it, you mentioned earlier on, what's obviously been part of the key to your success, which is that you, you hated the idea of and the reality of having a job. You, you're I, not I hated the idea of a job. Guy, right? Yeah, it's because a job to me represented someone else dictating where I spent my time, how much time I had to spend and how much I could make. And, and, and my time wasn't my own. And now some people love their job. Great. I'd, I'd say the majority of people don't love their job. And you know, you don't love your job. If you, if you were to win the lottery tomorrow and get $50 million with a jackpot or whatever, would you still go into work? Right. If your answer is no, then you probably are not going to that job for the purpose of getting income, which is okay. That's what most of us do. But I realized that from a very young age, even when I was a kid, that I, I just did not like the idea of not controlling my own destiny in every way. And so that's why I just never liked the idea of a job. And even in college, I just kind of, I saw college as a chance to goof off. I didn't see it as like, I'm going to go get a great job because uh, I certainly didn't treat it that way. It was, it was always the idea that I was going to be an entrepreneur of some kind. So, so how did you, how do you think you came by that disposition? Is it nature? Is it nurture? Is it? Uh, it's, it's reaction against my family, <laughs> okay. the way I was raised. So I was raised, um, you know, very, we were very, very poor for most of my childhood. Mm -hmm. And, um, in fact, our, our, our family was homeless for a little while. We were living off the kind of strangers, our groceries, groceries would come from strangers. We, we lived in somebody's shed out behind their house for about a, a six months to nine months. I mean, it was bad growing up and not, not my whole childhood, but majority of it. And I just saw that like, we didn't have anything. And, and uh, I wanted to not, I wanted to make sure that when I was old enough, I would have more than enough for my family and just, you know, never have to worry about money ever again. And I also just saw that the, the jobs my parents had oftentimes would dictate where we'd have to move. I lived in 10 different States, you know, throughout my childhood. So I lived all over the place. So there's, no, there's not a lot of stability there. And it just kind of made me think, you know what, I just want the opposite of what I've experienced. So then I, I figured that would have to be something other than having a job and and moving around for jobs and chasing money. You know, I'm going to make a, a a kind of a bold and probably politically incorrect assertion here, but it just popped into my head and I try to keep it <laughs> like, if I think it, I'm going to say it. It's your show. You don't have to be politically correct. <laughs> yeah, that's right. If you don't like what I'm about to say, then there's a thumbs down. Go probably. start your own show. <laughs> On this page, yeah. Poverty has, it almost seems to be like a form of abuse. And here's what I mean when I say that. If you look at people that come from abuse, they generally do one of two things. They either continue the cycle or they rebel Be against the cycle. Become an abuser themselves. Yeah, they either or, become yeah. an abuser or they are the dad that everybody would, or the, or the mom, the parent, the, the nurturing, yeah. loving person that says the cycle stops with me. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like poverty is the same way in, in the, the impact and the, the type of, of slow grinding trauma that it puts onto a person that they either, they either end up in that cycle with a, a mindset and an attitude and a set of behaviors and a, and eventually an, almost an, like they're a product of the, of the poverty or they're, or they're, or you uh, say a enough. product despite the poverty. Yeah. Yeah. You say enough. It stops with me. My kids lives will be different. And, mm -hmm. and I, I, man, it's like, I wish we could figure out, what is the difference? Where is the split in, in somebody's lifeline that says, it was this moment when I decided not to become a product of the cycle, but I decided to break the cycle. 
Well, I mean, I think you just nailed it on the head. Decision is a very powerful wor- word to decide is, you know, by its very definition, decide is to cut off right. all of their options and make a choice. And very few people want to make choices nowadays. Uh, we want everybody else to make our choices for us and some other group to make the choice for us, or whatever. So deciding is very important, but also believing, having some kind of belief that makes you step into that belief. So in other words, the belief that I had early on is that I could become a millionaire at a young age. And I just believed it for some strange where reason. Where did you get that? Where did, where did you get it? Because a lot of people in your um, situation never get that belief. Well, I mean, for me, actually, it was with, uh, I was involved with network marketing and multi-level marketing for years. And I never made any money doing it. I was horrible at it. But yeah. The one thing they do when they get you at those meetings is they, they indoctrinate you and teach you these beliefs like, you know, you don't need a job and, you know, a lot of them are great, great teachings, you know, and that you can become financially independent and, you, you know, your destiny is your own and there's no limits and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And I believed it all. I just thought, well, if it's true there, it's probably true in some other areas. And I realized that you could do it in a lot of different fields like real estate or online marketing. There's a lot of different ways to do it. And so I just took that belief with me. Well, as I got older, I learned new beliefs that people have. So I, run in, I ran into a new mentor this was not that many years ago. And he said, you know what, Brian, making millions of dollars is easy. I was like, well, that's crazy. That's, that can't be, that's, you know, that's offensive. Don't say that. Right, right. That's offensive. And he's like, well, no, no. It, I mean, for me, it's true. I don't, for you, it might not be true, but for me, it's making millions of dollars is easy. What if you had that belief, Brian? And I was like, well, that's just stupid. Like, you know, like offhand, you know, I can't even think about, I can't even entertain the idea that that might be true. And so I started saying to myself for years, I actually I have a, a story that I read to myself every morning. It's kind of the story of what's not yet true. It's like the story I want to be true. And it's a very powerful uh, exercise to do. But it's just uh, one of the things in my story, as I started saying, this was years ago, making millions of dollars is easy. And, uh, and it's amazing all the opportunities that start popping up suddenly when you start believing that. And not only that, what actually transpires in your bank account when you believe that. And you know, there's more involved than just belief. I'm not, I'm not saying that it's just like the secret. You sit around and you... You know, you right. envision millions and they drop in your lap. There's, there's actually work involved. But, but for me, the belief is what holds a lot of people back. And so they, they don't decide that they're going to have a different life, a different, and they also don't believe they really can. So they never take action. And I think that knowing what to do is not nearly as important as, as believing in what you could do. You know, I really belief precedes action. <coughs> so that's kind of, I went down a lot of rabbit holes there, but that, that for me was really powerful. And it all, all happened from people, mentors of mine that taught me these things. Well, yeah, I mean, you, you're, you're touching on so many different aspects of the, the universal formula for success. I mean, it's, it's mentorship. It's, it's commitment to one thing to the exclusion of so many other things, you know, like, and, and, mm-hmm. and, and one of it, what I like about your language, you know, you've used some specific language. You said, look, cash flow is better than earned income. Mm-hmm. You tell yourself a story every day that says, Making millions of dollars is easy. Now, a lot of people tell them, you know, that do affirmations and mantras or whatever, they, you know, that, that, that to me, sometimes a lot of times there's, there's a lack of specificity. It's like, you know, happiness is achievable or, or more. The goal is more. Yeah. You're like, no bullshit. Millions of dollars. Yes. That's a specific thing. And it's, and it's money focused. Right? You know, I'm sure you've read, uh, I think I have a copy of it. Yeah, here it is. This book right here, Secrets of the Millionaire Mind. Yeah, T. Harv Eker. Yeah, it's great. I got it right over here. And one of the things that he talks about in here is that rich people care a lot about money. Mm -hmm. You're not going to get a lot of something that isn't important to you. And he tries to sort of uh, remove the shame from being like, yeah, I want a lot of money. Well, it just takes, takes a lot of balls to admit to yourself that you really even if you don't believe it, that you want to believe something that outlandish, you know, because who am I to think that that's actually could be easy. Now, you know, easy is all relative, but I mean, in the grand scheme of things, it, it could be a lot easier than you think. I'm not saying easy means you push a button and not, you don't, and then it just happens. I'm saying easy relative to what you think might be possible. Now, if you're aiming for, if you're aiming for, you know, hundreds of dollars is easy to make and that's your belief. Well, then you'll, you're probably not going to stumble into millions. The right. same, same way that, you know, I've been thinking lately, what's a billion dollar idea? You know, that's a different kind of question to ask. What's a billion dollar idea? How, how does somebody make a billion dollars? If that's what, if that, you know, that's a whole nother level of thinking right. of abundance. But the questions that you ask will determine kind of the opportunities that you see. And so I started doing that a long time ago. And it was amazing how that kind of unfolds. So I sometimes see people and they're like, hey, Brian, I am, you know, I'm, I'm making $15 an hour right now. And I'm trying to figure out how to get to $20 an hour. 
Mm-hmm. And I'm like, great, I can show you how to do that. But have you ever thought bigger for yourself? You know, why, why limit it to that? Why work for anything per hour? Why not have money coming in that you're not working for every hour? You know, just trying to always question yourself and think about what's, what's the more empowering belief, not just with money, but what's the more empowering story that might not yet be true for you that you could start believing. And I, I hate to use the word brainwashing, but I do. I, I think brainwashing can be a positive thing if you're brainwashing yourself and you're aware of it. So I'm aware that I'm always brainwashing myself because I'm always believing things that aren't true until they are, if that makes sense. Because you're, you're going to get brainwashed by your external influences or by yourself. So I'd rather just choose my own beliefs. So I'm going to do a little math. You've just inspired me with what you're saying. Um, I'm going to do a little math. So you know the, the rule of 72 basically that says, mm-hmm. you know, based on your rate of return, your money doubles. So... Mm-hmm. 72 at 20, your money would at 20% return, your money would double every three and a half years at 25%. Your money would double about every less little as under three years to double your money, right? Mm -hmm. So hang on 72. There's a reason I'm doing this 72 divided 2.88 years. So uh, times two, that means it would quadruple in 5.76 years Mm -hmm. plus 2.88. That means it would go eight times So basically, anyway, long story short, the math I just did says that for you to make 10 times your money in 10 years, you have to average about between a 20 and 25% a year rate of return. Mm -hmm. Here's why I'm saying that. You're talking about a billion dollars. I've been thinking, I want you to know, like I'm I'm owning this. I've been thinking about making a billion dollars lately. Like what, what would it really take to do this? I'm 40. Uh, you know, I've come, look at what I've, I, I look at what I've done in the last 12 years, roughly the last decade. I started online when I was 28, I was half a million dollars in debt. Mm-hmm. I've done over $40 million in sales in 10 years or 12 years. Like this stuff really happens. Like it's out there. Okay. So, so where do we go from here? Well, let's say I had 10 million bucks now. If I just did 20 to 25% a year return starting at 40, how much would I have when I'm 50? Mm-hmm. I'd have $100 million. Mm-hmm. And if I did it again, how much would I have when I'm 60? Mm-hmm. I'd have a billion dollars. You can add a zero every decade yep. if you average between 20 and 25% a year on, on your entire net worth. Well, what is if you did actually, that? Is that amount of return actually that crazy for an entrepreneur? Well, I don't know if it is or it isn't, but what if you didn't need any money to create a billion dollars? I feel like I just set you up. <laughs> so, so like I, I've been having these conversations lately because I'm understanding how how people sell companies how people take companies public all that kind of stuff I've, I've, I've been meeting people that do that and what's interesting is that a lot of times somebody who sells their company for a billion dollars it's sometimes they're not even profitable I mean look at uber I mean how many bill tens of billions of dollars and they're still not profitable probably will never be and you know there's there's people that are they're building apps and companies or whatever and because somebody else believes they have value, they can sell that idea for billions of dollars. So I really think there's billion, billions or millions of dollars in just ideas. It's just a matter of having the idea that other people will get behind. And you know, you think of like Theranos, you know, it was actually probably a scam, the lady right, right. prison or whatever, but her idea and her belief in herself and what she was doing created a multi-billion dollar company with, with no proof, no profits, nothing. I'm not saying you should scam people. I'm just saying that, that, Wealth, wealth is sprouts from ideas as much as it can sprout from uh, capital and from money. And, and, and so I'm, always, I'm always asking myself, what's, what's the idea that could be the next big idea? And even like you just said with the course, the Airbnb course, there, nobody had an Airbnb course before I did. Mm-hmm. So when I had that idea, I just thought to myself, this is worth millions immediately. And it was. And, so let me, you know, let me yeah. seize on that because there's something going on right now that's you know, kind of big waves all over the internet with the knowledge business blueprint. Of course. Uh, launch and you know that this idea which is not new it's not new to say oh take your knowledge and package it and sell it Mm -hmm. Uh, they've just gotten some big names to unify around the message but you're you're one of the best examples i know of that who's like literally a guy who like does a thing (laughs) and has an idea and is like hey i should i should sell this to other people right i mean i have a friend who yeah who, who to solve his own snoring problem he put some adhesive on this plastic strip to pull his nostrils apart and he ended up selling, creating the Breathe Right strip. Which is worth what? Got a oh, fortune. They sold, it sold, Breathe Right sold for $2 billion to Glaxo. Oh 
There you go. A multi-billion dollar like idea. He's tinkering in his basement for, he's a, a literally a good friend of mine. He's tinkering in his basement for five years trying to solve his snoring problem. <laughs> so this has been around for a while. Like you yeah. have an idea, you package it, you sell it. What, what would you say? I mean, you're a great example of somebody like this. Maybe walk us through yeah. how you, I mean, you've, you, I think you've talked about how you develop the confidence that, hey, I could do this. Maybe talk about the mechanics of like, how did you actually, for somebody who didn't have previous experience creating a course or doing digital mm. marketing, how did you package it? How did you get it to market? What did you run into? What worked? What didn't work? And how did you ultimately get it to, to blow up like it did? Well, you know, I, I was making really good money uh, right out the gate with Airbnb. I still do Airbnb as well, but like right out the gate, I started making all this income with these prop rental properties that I didn't, didn't own. I was putting them on Airbnb and I was kind of figuring out some kind of formula to how to do that. And because I couldn't find anybody else doing it online, I thought, well, I know this is something people will be interested in because they're already asking me about it. Friends are asking me about it. People see that I have this crazy lifestyle and I, I don't work hardly at all. And I have all this income coming in and I'm just living off this portfolio of properties because I couldn't go buy them. So I just use other people's properties. And I just thought, well, somebody would probably pay me for that information, but nobody else is doing it. So it's either going to be a really good idea or a really bad idea. Like this won't work at all or a, it'll be very valuable because I'll be the first guy to do this. Right. And it ended up being the latter. But I really just started looking at what other people were doing. I looked at people that I could model. I said, well, obviously other people are selling courses online about other topics. What are they doing? And I just started looking at what they're doing and trying to model what they're doing. And, uh, and I had a lot of, and I also just educated myself. I started buying courses. I bought yeah. courses on how to do courses. So I bought a course from our mutual friend, Mike Dillard, yeah. to learn how to do seven figure sales presentations. Like how do, yeah. I got to buy a course on how to do a webinar. So I started ed investing in myself. So I spent th tens of thousands of dollars investing in myself. And then, you know, when I released my product and released my webinar, it just works and everybody thinks it's magic. And I'm like, no, I, I spent a lot of time and energy to do that. And I, I didn't reinvent the wheel. So I think that anything you want to learn is learnable. Um, if you really believe you can learn anything, I'm not particularly sharp on a computer. I don't, I don't code. I don't, I'm not good with software, but I learned it all and figured it out. And I think the key is whoever you're going to learn from, just make sure they've gotten the result that you want. So like, if you want to learn Airbnb, you should come to me and I'll show you how to do it. You can make a lot of money on Airbnb and not own property. But if you're going to come to me and want tax advice or accounting advice, I'm not the guy. And I'll just tell you, I'm not the guy. Right. Um, you know, and there's things I don't teach. So you want to find somebody who's gotten the result that you want and then learn from that person, do everything that person tells you to do. Don't try to go in 10 different directions and, you know, I think sometimes with this whole mastery mindset, I, there's nothing wrong with mastering something, but I think entrepreneurs fall into the trap of trying to, there is no such thing as mastering everything. You can't master everything. You can only choose to be a, mas a mastery in a few very narrow things. So I think um, trying to, to learn for the sake of learning is a big waste of time for most entrepreneurs. You should, you should uh -huh. learn some things that you should get really good at. Like I got really good at teaching, really good at teaching, really good at like being on video, for example. Mm -hmm. But everything else, I'm not really that great at. I hire people to do for me. And, and I think that, that a lot of entrepreneurs get caught in the trap because they're like, well, I would sell my course, but I, I just can't figure out how to do email marketing. And I've been studying it for the last two years. And I'm like, hire an email, email marketing specialist, you know? Yeah. Like, you know, so that it's kind of like, I, I just don't buy into that. You have to know every single skill set to be successful because you really I mean, don't. I think that, that, that the knowledge economy and the, the, the internet itself has kind of created this fallacy that you're talking about that like mm -hmm. well, the, all, all the information's out there. And so success is as simple as you gathering and learning all the information. Well, no, but there's actually, too much information. <laughs> you'll spend your whole life learning a smidgen of the information and get, getting nowhere. Yeah. If I could just get a little bit more before I take action. Oh God, I know it's painful. And, and here I'm going to suggest that maybe one of the reasons why this came naturally to you is because of your past experience with, with, with flipping houses. Hmm. Cause I, I've done some, I'm actually in the middle of a couple house flips right now. And honestly, I'll probably never do them again. It's not my cup of tea. And I'm in this situation where it's like, Jeff, you can, you can bitch and moan. You can be frustrated. You can do whatever, but at the end of the day, the only way out is to get to the end, mm -hmm. get the houses done and get them off your books. And then you're free. When you, to me, building a course, it's so easy to like get lost and like, well, I'm going to tile the bathroom myself and I'm going to, 
you know, I'm going to go around with a leveler and make sure every countertop in, is flat. And it's like, no, dude, just hire the people, get them in there, bang it out, sell the damn thing, cash it in. Yeah. You treated creating a course like flipping a house where it, nothing matters except selling it. Yeah, right? that's, the perfect, that's the perfect analogy. It's like trying to go on a road trip and you, before you go on the road trip, you're going to try to learn how to rebuild your engine in the car. It's like, you don't need to learn, you need to know how to do that. You just got to get in the car, turn the key and go. And if it doesn't work, go get a different car. It's like, you're focusing on the wrong things. And I see a lot of entrepreneurs doing that. So for, I'll give you an example. So when I built my course and I did it, Maybe I went a little bit overboard, but the proof is in the pudding. I, I took six months. I like to, love to tell this story. I, I gave myself six months to build the world's best course on the topic of Airbnb. And of course, there was no course on it. So I said, I'm, gonna, I'm going to do nothing but build a course for six months. Now, nowadays, they all teach you, everybody teaches you, market a course before you right. create it. Right, right. Now, I didn't do it that way. I, I, I took the chance and I put all my chips on the table and I said, I know this is going to work. I'm going to go for it. But what I did is I not only spent six months doing that, I was living off my Airbnb income, so I didn't have to go to a job. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about 40, 50 hours a week working on my course for six months doing research and putting it all together and all that stuff. I took my TV, I put it in the attic. Yes. I said, I will not look at this TV again until I'm done with my course. I put the TV in the attic. I took all the books, and I have hundreds of books. I took all the books out of my room, put them in a box except for three. I had Jeff Walker's product launch formula. I had dot com. No, it was before dot com secrets came out. I had, a, I had three books. That's all I had was three books on how to, do, how to do online marketing. And I didn't own any other. So I just said, okay, those are the only books I'm going to study. I'm going to go buy some more. And I was like ruthless. I stopped dating. I was single at the time. I, I very rarely went out with friends. I was like, I'm going to do this. And then it, it, was, it was a little less than six months later, I had the course done. And then I realized I couldn't sell it. So I worked on another skill set, which was webinars. And I went deep on webinars and deep on webinars and I obsessed over webinars. And that took about three months. So now I'm nine months in, still not, not making any money in this business. Um, but I launched my first webinar and it converted 33% of the people that were on the webinar bought. And I did $67,000 my first 90 minutes ever doing a live webinar. And, and then a million dollars in the next 43 days. Right. So another million dollars in 43 days. And people think, oh my gosh, that's amazing. And I'm like, no, I, I learned some skill sets that I knew I had to learn and I shut everything else out. I stopped doing everything else. And I think that's where most people don't get so far off is they're just, they don't know, they don't decide I'm going to master this thing and it's the next, and they don't know what the thing is to master. So then they just get all over the place and you can't put like three or four days of concentrated effort and get something really amazing out. It just doesn't work that way generally. You got to put in time. And uh, maybe not six months, maybe you don't have the, the, the luxury of doing that, but every entrepreneur I talk to, they have the same I'm, problem. I'm calling BS, everybody does. You yeah. know why? You know how I know that? Because if your son was diagnosed with a terminal illness, your son or daughter, and the doctor said, listen, man, there's a, there's a cure for this, but you gotta go in your backyard and you gotta dig. Mm -hmm. And you're gonna need to dig for six hours a day, for six mm -hmm. days a week, for six months. You and eventually find you're going to get deep enough that you're going to find the cure and your son's going to be okay. You would do it. Yeah. You would rearrange whatever you had to, to do it. And somebody might say, yeah, but Jeff, that's not a fair comparison. That's you're talking about my son living versus maybe I sell a course or not. Okay. I'll admit it's not a fair comparison, but it does prove that it's possible and that yep. it's just a function of motivation. Well, your fire, you'd be, you have a lot, a lot, a lot of fire involved if it's, you're talking about somebody that you love, yeah. but but I, had that much, I, I, I had that much fire. Motivated you are. Yeah, exactly. And I had that much fire involved in making sure my dreams became a reality that I, I financially could live the life that I wanted to live. And I was willing to pay the price. And I think people are not willing to pay the price or they think that they're paying the price, but what they're doing is they're just staying busy. And, you know, it happens to me all the time. I've had, I've had friends come to me and say, you know, I have a really successful blah, blah, blah business here locally. And I'm thinking about maybe doing Airbnb as well. What do you think? Should I get your course? And I'm like, no, no, not unless you want to be in this business. Don't get my course. I'm like, what do you mean? I said, you have a successful business. Like focus on your business, focus on that. Well, no, I think I want to do that too. I'm like, you could, but now you're going to be doing two businesses. So, so how well is that going to work out? And then I say, and you last month, you mentioned another business that you're thinking about doing. <laughs> and so I don't know what business you're in. And I, a mentor of mine, once again, said the same thing. He's like, what business are you in, Brian? I was like, what does that mean? What business are you in? I was like, I don't know. I do a little of this, a little of that, a little. He's like, no, 
you got to be in a, you got to be stand for something. And I said, all right, I'm going to stand for flipping houses. I just, I did you know, I like, I'll flip houses. And I ended up flipping like a hundred properties and making millions. And so it's like, it's, it's really focus is, and that's one of the books I have on my, on my shelf right here is, is the book called focus is such an underrated uh, asset that you can have. And if you can learn the discipline of focus, you can do just about anything. You really can. And, but it comes, you have to be brave. You have to be willing to say, I'm going to do this until it kills me or I, I break through, you know? Mm -hmm. And I just think a lot of entrepreneurs can't, can't get to that point. And I, I, I'm, I'm preaching myself here because sometimes I will get unfocused and I'm like, wait a second, what business am I in? I got to get, and, and the perfect yeah. example is flipping houses. I was flipping houses still. I was flipping houses some, some last year and it's, I just, I, I couldn't do it. I was like, I, I, I'm not in that business anymore. I'm going to stop that. I'm going to focus on what I do. You know? Yeah, it's, um, it's interesting. I, I appreciate you saying that. Like, like personally, I appreciate it because you're preaching to me too. Um, and it's, it's funny. I've, it's taken me a while to figure out what business I'm in. Mm. And now having figured it out, it is the ultimate lens that I can look at everything through and say, does this belong in my life or not? Mm -hmm. And for me, I'm an entrepreneurial, I'm in the entrepreneurial evangelism business. It's not even education. It's evangelism. You know, exegesis is part of evangelism. Like you open up the book and you read the scripture and whatever. But evangelism is different from education. And, and, and for me, it's the mess. The good news is entrepreneurial. It's mm -hmm. technology. It's the modern economy. And I'm an evangelist and I teach people and I empower people and I inspire people. And if it doesn't fit in that, it doesn't exist in my world, but I, but I, t I get on focus. I mean, I mentioned I'm flipping a couple houses right now. That's because two years ago, I got distracted and now I'm still having to deal with it. I have to write out, when I write out my annual goals, I write out my annual not to do list as well. So I, I say, okay, this is what I'm doing in 2020. This is what I'm not doing in 2020. So as starting in 2020, I will no longer be buying and renovating properties ever. I'm just not doing it. I've got a friend that's making tons of money in commercial real estate. I've always wanted to do commercial real estate, but guess what? If I take my eye off the prize right now, what I'm doing with Airbnb, what I'm doing with with training on Airbnb and everything related to Airbnb, I'm going to miss the ball because I know where I'm going with it. And if I go do commercial real estate, I could also make millions, but I could also risk what I'm doing. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs, they don't marry their thing. They don't decide. It's like if you're, if, if you want to have a successful marriage and then every month you're looking at some other person you could marry, like oh, I could marry five women. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, you maybe could, but it's, you're not, it's very going to be very hard to have a successful marriage if you're constantly looking for more you know, more options instead of saying, no, there's going to be times where marriage is hard. There's going to be times where it's very challenging and I want to quit, but I've committed to them. And I'm not saying you have to do one business for your whole life, but you do have to do one business to get the result that you're after. So if you're, if your aim, if you believe millions, it's making millions of dollars is easy and you haven't yet made millions of dollars and maybe it's not time to quit. Maybe it's time to double down, you know? Yeah. And I, I think for me, that's what it is. I got to double down on what my thing is and I don't stop just when it gets tough or when I get distracted or shiny objects and dream, like, oh, there's this new thing that other people are doing or look what Jeff's doing. I'm going to go do what Jeff's doing because it's very tempting. It's very mm -hmm. tempting. Yeah. And it's tempting to go do what Brian's doing too. <laughs> <laughs> it always looks like somebody else is doing something more right, awesome. You're just making it look so easy. You know, you got the, you got the collared shirt. And so uh, yeah, impressive. no, I have, I have a rack of collared shirts back here. So I'm, no, I'm it's rocking Motley Crue over here, you know, you know, it's, it's really true though. I mean, I think that, that I've been really studying a lot of like Ben Franklin's, Benjamin Franklin's teachings and the, the idea of the, um, the, you know, the, the core qualities and attributes and, and like uh, character qualities that we don't talk about anymore. Like nobody talks about character. They all talk about habits, which habits is great, but mm -hmm. there's something deeper than habits. It's called character. So do you have the character of, of being somebody who's persistent or somebody who's, you know, uh, um, patient. You got to be patient for success. Sometimes you have to be relentless. You have to be uh, have integrity. You know these kind of things. And by developing those character qualities, all the habits are going to fall into place because you become a person that's consistent, that's that shows up, that you know never stops. That's you know um, those kind of things. So I've been thinking a lot about that and and having the quality of being able to focus and decide and um, you know uh, prioritize all these kind of things. I've been thinking about like what are the character qualities of a person that's super, super successful in life and business? How can I develop those character qualities above all? And then that will dictate my actions and my habits and all those kind of things.
And you know, every currency has has value in the right marketplace. You know, there's some currencies that have no value because you're just trying to use them in the wrong place. What I have found is that character and and the virtues and the, the types of intangibles that you're talking about are an immensely valuable currency mm-hmm. when you get around really wealthy and successful people. They really are. They are look they? for that more. They look for that more than intelligent, you know, I think it was Warren Buffett said, you know, if, if I can't have Give me a, a tr- I forget what he said. It was like a, a good person or a, a, a sm- if he's like, I'd rather have a, a smart, good person, but a dumb, lazy per- or a, oh God, I can't remember. But basically he was saying, I don't want smart people unless they're also good. They also have the character. Yeah. Yeah. Because if otherwise they'll actually screw me over. Yeah. I'd, no, rather, than be dumb, I'd rather than be dumb and motivated than bad and smart and motivated. Sorry, so no, it's tr- I totally it's, it, butchered the quote. No, right? I get what you're saying. It's totally true. In fact, I had a conversation with somebody that I was working with recently who is, uh, I've kind of mentored a little bit. He's kind of new to the industry. And he told me a couple different things that he was going to deliver on and do, and he never did them. And it happened where it was three or four times where, hey, I'll get that to you. I'll get that to you. I'll get that to you. And finally, I just said to him, I said, look, I'm not mad, but I'm just going to tell you that I I do not do business with people that don't follow through on their word because when I say to somebody something will be done, it will be done. And if it can't be because of some kind of emergency or something, I always let people know, look, I got to renegotiate. I can't do it or I need more time. But I don't let things fall through the cracks. And if you let things fall through the cracks, you won't be working with me or anybody like me because all the people I know that are really successful, if they tell me they're going to do something, that's their word. They fall. I mean, they just have integrity with themselves. Mm -hmm. So one thing you got to learn if you want to be successful is you got to have integrity. And when you tell me you're going to do something three or four times and it doesn't get done, it doesn't matter to me. I can go hire somebody else and get it done. It's just, I like you. And I think you should know that you're missing a huge opportunity here. And he he said, Oh my gosh, I've just never had anybody tell me something like that before. I didn't realize what I was doing. And I said, yeah, it's fine. You just should never promise something to somebody that you can't follow through on and you know you're going to follow through on. And as you do that, you'll get that reputation as that kind of person. Yeah, and, and that's the key is you, it's, it's something- that's a, char- that's a character quality. And yeah. you demonstrate it over time. You demonstrate it and, and you build it. You don't, you know, it's not like you have to be a perfect human being. It's just that you're always aiming to be better at that. And, and the funny thing is when you start doing that, guess what you do? You attract other people just like you. You start flocking with those kind of people. They start recognizing you as one of them. Mm-hmm. They're like, wow, that Jeff guy, stand up guy, he's got integrity. He does good work. He offers great products. You know, his people love him. Great reputation. You know, those things precede you and th- those things can't be faked. So I found the Buffett quote and it's pretty great. I love Buffett quotes. <laughs> he says, we look for three things when we hire people. We look for intelligence. We look for initiative or energy and we look for integrity. If they mm-hmm. don't have the latter, the first two will kill you because if you're going to get someone without integrity, you want them lazy and dumb. <laughs> wow it's pretty solid man that's wow. a great quote um and it's exactly what you're talking about at the end of the day these guys the people that can change your life with a sparkle in their eye and, and or, a, or a decision or a promotion mm-hmm. or a level of you know i've had a few people that i've come across who co- created in bizarre like like drastically disruptively different possibilities for my life Like, for example, the guy that owned the company that used to be an affiliate of was like, hey, I'd like you to come to New York and help me run the company. He had 40,000 affiliates he could have said that to. Wow. And I was the one he picked. It's just there have been a few things like that because where where you have to put in years of of commitment to being the best and doing the right things the right way. But was was that – some people might say, well, you were lucky because you were in the right place at the right time. But we'd we'd probably have to argue that it had nothing to do with luck. (laughs) No, or or that you make your own luck. You make your own luck. I mean, you you know, luck is when opportunity meets preparation. You know, I'd been getting prepared for years. Yeah. And um, and I think that, you know, that's something that a lot of people – the internet, I think, has – uh, you know, corroded that mindset. The internet has created such a, an immediate gratification mm-hmm. culture because everything seems so accessible and it seems to happen so fast. Well, yeah, information is accessible. That doesn't mean results are accessible. Yeah, and it was who you were that, it, that, it, that attracted that person, that opportunity into your life. And I think a lot of times we don't see the backstory. So I love talking to people and hearing the actual backstory. Like, look, there's a lot of work that came before the success 
because nobody wants to po post anything about the journey. They just want to post about the result, you know? And, and so it's good to sometimes know that everybody's on this journey and, and very rarely does somebody just stumble into something. And you said you, you spent nine months, you put your TV in the attic, you put all your books in a box except for three. And you said it was before dot-com secrets. It was before dot com. And dot com secrets was what, 2015, 16? I got it right here. It's such an important book series. I got them sitting right here. Um, yeah, it was before. I think it, was, it might have been right around the same time. Uh, it, okay. it probably was around the same time that dot com secrets came out because after I tried my webinar, it didn't sell. I had to go back to the drawing board. I think it was right around that same time. But the course itself I'd created before I ever heard of Russell or any of that stuff. So. Um, so that book was, yeah, so that book was published in 2015. The reason I'm asking about this, because I first heard about you in maybe 2018, 19-ish. Mm -hmm. And then, mm -hmm. you know, you're a big name. You got, you're going on the Grant Cardone show. You're doing, you know, launch with Ty Lopez. Like, Brian's the guy, right? But to hear you tell it, you started working on this course like five years before that. Yeah, well, it wasn't five years, but it was before I ever knew who Russell Brunson was. I don't even know. If it was 2015, I heard about you in 1819. Mm -hmm. You know, again. Well, like, well, put it this way. I, I started my online education company in 16. I founded 16, it in okay. 2016. So, two, so there's at least two or three years that mm -hmm. you're toiling away. And I mean, in nine months where like you're a nobody. Well, I was lit. I was doing my Airbnb business. And then I was, I was trying to take what I knew from my Airbnb business and turn it into some kind of outline, some kind of course. So I was working on all that, but I didn't know any marketers. I didn't know any online marketers. I didn't, I didn't, like I said, I had three books and that wasn't, none of those books were these books. And I didn't know what I was doing other than I was, I was trying to figure out how in the world to make a course out of what I had. And so that was, uh, that was it. But, you know, after I realized, man, I gotta, I gotta get in a community of people that can kind of help me and, and connect with the right people. That's kind of how I heard about click funnels and started getting to know people there. And that was where things really accelerated quickly. Cause I was like, Oh, now I got people that actually know this, this side of the business. So I could have gone faster had I known that. But, um, but the point of the story is that I was, I was willing to, you know, if the TV is a perfect example, I was willing to say, I don't deserve to watch TV until I make a million dollars in this new business. Like I don't, I don't deserve it. Like I don't even, I'm not even going to think about TV again. Netflix. If there's a, if there's a take the away quote from this conversation, I want it to be that. I don't deserve to watch TV until I make a million dollars. If every single person <laughs> who sees that video, who has not already made a million dollars, will say that to themselves and mean it, this conversation will have a significant impact in the world. Amen. Like, honestly, anybody listening and watching right now, if I were to, if I were to write you a check for a million dollars, you can cash a year from now, but you can't watch TV or Netflix or Hulu or anything for the next 12 months, could you do it? Well, you can. You could do that for yourself if you want to, but you got to be willing to pay the price. I love it. Honestly, man, um, we, we've actually been talking for almost over 45 minutes, probably almost an hour been great man is which is tremendous and i think longer than we budgeted but it's just flown by and i've really enjoyed it um i want to make sure that we we give you an opportunity to share with people obviously you have a great course called bnb formula mm -hmm. um, i am going to make sure that there's a link to that course below this video wherever this video exists yeah. um is there anything else you'd like to share with people as far as how they can find you or, or come follow you and get more more of your greatness yeah i would say look you know um more than Airbnb training or anything like that. If you just want to follow what I'm up to and what I teach and some of the things we talked about, you can find me at any of the social channels. So it's at B Pagester. That's B P A G S T E R at B Pagester. And I have videos on there and, and just really cool content and stuff like that. You could check out. And I talk about books a lot. So you can see what I'm reading. I think that's the best way to follow me. Good, good. Yeah. And I encourage everyone to do that. You know, as you've, you know, anybody who's followed my, these interviews that I'm doing, um, there's a consistent theme here, which is that the people that we talk to on, on this show are good at at least three things, probably more, but at least three things that they, that they get good at. One is they get good at whatever the thing is that they're, they're selling or promoting as a service or product or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. But they also, separate from that, get good at the marketing and sale of that thing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's one thing to be a good dentist and know how to extract a tooth. It's another skill to know how to run a yeah. dental practice and sell your dentistry, right? Mm -hmm. So they get good at that. So that's two things. And then the third thing is, this is a consistent theme. 
they're always working on themselves. They're mm-hmm. always good at self-development. And that, mm-hmm. is, that is an actual thing. It's not some, it's not some afterthought that just kind of happens with whatever's left over. It's something you put at the forefront of your life. Foundational. Reading yeah, reading books, li- watching videos, listening to podcasts, mm-hmm. just working on yourself, right? Going to the gym, however that shows up. And so I think it's good to not only buy people's courses, but actually follow guys like Brian. Learn, don't just learn from what he knows. Learn from who he is. Thank right? you. Um, so, yeah, man, any, any final thoughts before we, we wrap? Um, I would say, who are you not to do something great? Everybody, who, who are you not to do something really amazing with your life? So you just got to decide what that thing is and, and believe that it's possible for you. That's what I think. Tremendous. I got nothing to add other than put away your TV. <laughs> Kill awesome. your TV right now. Yeah, thank you so much for being here, Brian. Um, we'll get that link below for everyone, anyone that wants to check out the course. And I just appreciate the person you are and the time we just got to spend. Thanks, Jeff. Appreciate you.